Hello, welcome to Silicon Valley 2.0. I am your host, Sabrina Halper, and on behalf of the Hindustan Times, I want to welcome our very special guest, Harrison Hoffman. Thank you, Harrison, for being here today. You, How good. are you doing? Doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing well. So let's begin. You're from Los Angeles, and currently you are a senior at Stanford University, where I also attend. <laughs> And recently, you co-founded Sparrow Lending. And Sparrow Lending, it's an online crowdsourcing platform, and it's a loan marketplace, which is still in its pilot phase, and it allows students to fund their tuition and living expenses through small, non-accredited loans based on their GPA and personal stories. So I'm really gonna let you take it away. Could you tell us about the story behind Sparrow Lending and what inspired you to start it? Great question. Um, so I have to take you back to my freshman year orientation. So this was a really unique time wherein we were meeting students from all across the globe from the first times in our lives. And when we saw these students, to not be cliche, through them, we simply saw the future. But what we came to realize is that that future looks different for two types of students. The first type of student is a student that universities love to place on brochures. This is an individual that leverages college as the tool with which to enact change in their life. But the second type of student was an overlooked case, an individual that we can call Nate. So Nate is born into a middle-class suburb outside of Los Angeles. He has five older siblings. None of them have gone to university, but he's determined to flip the script. And he's told that his attendance at a private elite institution is his ticket to a better life. But what's not yeah. included in this generic brochure is the financial hardship that's associated with his attendance. So to make it out, yeah. my friend had to take out $25,000 at an 8% APR before the first year end of college. You know, while he um, was sending money back home, his friends were fielding internship offers. While he was scouring the internet for better refinance rates on his student loans, his friends were attending business organizations and networking events. And so for Nate and countless students across the country like him, his ticket out was non-inclusive. It didn't include the last mile of expenses associated with his attendance. But at Sparrow, we gleaned very actionable insights of what needs to change in Nate's story. You know, his problem, it's existed for a long time and it's not gonna go away immediately. But what yeah. we've done is we've created this sustainable solution that allows us to address the core issues such that the better we do, the more impact we're gonna make. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. And I just wanna, dive deeper into that a bit so why did you decide to take out factors such as credit score or income histories in sparrow lending and it's assessing students credit worthiness sure so really those two criteria credit worthiness and income tax information are essentially negligible for college students they are banked on history having credit history um, lending history but unfortunately for students, we are 18 to around 23 years old as an undergraduate, which means that although our credit scores might reflect someone who lives a lavish lifestyle or spends exorbitantly, it's just not the case. We haven't had time to accrue this information. And so there's a time asymmetry which doesn't allow for the underwriting process, the credit worthiness of the individual to be accurate. And so it has to be based on alternative data that's a little bit more reflective. Yeah. And so about that alternative data, would you underwrite different majors differently, for example? Yeah, so Sparrow, although we don't actually have a hard line, we really are a marketplace solution. Yeah. We leave it open to uh, lenders who come on the platform to make their own decisions. For the recommendations that we do make to students, um, we try and predict their early career median income, and that is based on the major that they're pursuing in college. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder, do you think that a student majoring in finance might be more likely to get loans than a student majoring in art history or English? Maybe. So yeah, I mean, it, 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 major is, a, is one compounding factor, but say for example that that art history major you know, has worked at a, a really compelling internship at Sotheby's. That's yeah. a really uh, compelling thing to include in your loan application to really reduce your interest rates. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And how do you assess the risk in a context where we don't know how unemployment is going to look for new grads, especially after and during the pandemic? So for these new grads, is, is there a greater risk in you know, getting, getting a job and being able to pay loans back? Um, so how we look at it is we try and take a data-driven approach. 
um, and use historical data sets to hopefully predict and have some reasonable uh, assumption about the future. And so although we're coming into unprecedented times with the unemployment market, um, we hope to leverage historical data to really give us an indication and, and little keyhole into what will happen into the future. And so to answer the question directly, there won't be a lot that we change in our approach uh, from this coming year to say a year from now, hopefully when a vaccine's released. Um, but it is something that we take into consideration when we're trying to assess an individual's credit worthiness. Got it. And you know, who is the ideal lender in this case? Who do you hope would, would lend to a student? Yeah, so this is, this is an individual who is altruistically inclined, um, but we like to say that altruism doesn't scale. So we're also trying to sell this as a competitive financial debt investment. Um, but really, when someone is trying to trust us, a startup that doesn't have a brand yet, with their money in investing in students, which is a pretty novel concept, um, we have to find someone that already has an inclination of giving back to their university and is looking to make a direct impact and investment in the college and students that helped build their career. Got it. And how do you think the market for capital is right now? Do you think there's a lot of money for loans out there? Yeah, so that's another great question. Um, one of the things that we've looked heavily into is how do we compare against other alternatives that retail investors have exposure to, debt investments? This is, goes back to the timing of the question. Those uh, are treasury bills, municipal bonds, and money market funds. But during COVID, in the run-up to COVID, and definitely after COVID, the interest rates, and they're gonna be near negligible. And so when we can offer a lender four and a half to five and a half percent on average, with somewhere around a 98 and a half to 99 and a half percent repayment rate, suddenly it becomes a really attractive financial investment that not only betters yourself, but also your community. Yeah, totally. And I wanna ask you about peer-to-peer -peer social lending on a more general scale. So you're essentially acting as a financial matchmaker. And you know, what's the regulatory landscape around that? Because I know there have been some major roadblocks for, roadblocks for some of these huge um, social lending companies. And you know, how did you get up to speed on that? Great question. Um, and this is really where uh, the Stanford community helped me in that there are a bunch of entrepreneurs that are two, three, four years further down the road than I am and, and the rest of the Spare team is. And looking back, they helped guide us uh, and find the right legal counsel. And so we've engaged with uh, a law firm and individuals that really understand the space, have been in it for collectively over 20 years um, from a security standpoint and from a banking standpoint. And so before we launch publicly, we'll ensure that from financial and legal compliance, uh, everything's gonna be airtight. Okay, great, I'm looking forward to it. And you know, discussing, discussing your competition, how is Spare Lending different from a company such as SoFi, for example? Definitely. So SoFi takes a traditional lending model approach. Um, they do balance yeah. lending, wherein they'll lend from you know, credit that they've raised, and they have their own criteria of who can qualify and who can't. What Sparrow does is we just connect those looking to invest in individuals. We don't lend ourselves. And so why we think this is more scalable and, and to be honest, uh, a more sustainable approach for the individual is there's a disconnect between two disparate groups. And we are just trying to be the AI slash ML powered engine that connects the two. How do you think that Sparrow can help in the issue of student loans, student loan debt in general? Because I have a statistic here that says student loan debt in 2020 is now over $1.5 trillion in the United States. And that's an average of $37,000 in debt for each borrower. So this is such a major problem for students and post-grads and people who have been out of college for decades even. And I ask like, why do you believe this system is so broken? And you know, how would you hope Sparrow could have, a, could have a hand in fixing that? And this is honestly why we started the company. We yeah. as college students uh, are watching our friends take money out on someone else's terms, which leads to these massive holes. And so what we wanted to do was reverse the process. At Sparrow, we allow a student at their own interest rate and choose their own repayment plan, which, 
from the individual perspective, will always be the best alternative if they can find funding. Presumably, you've never set it at an interest rate higher than you can find elsewhere. And so in that regard, we're trying to allow the individual to take their financial future back into their own hands, give them a type of control that previously they never had access to. In terms of your experience and your role at Sparrow, right now it's in its pilot phase. I have two questions. When do you think it's going to launch? And at what point would you, as a founder who is also a student, when would you be willing to go full-time with it? What's the mark of success that, that you know you're going to go full, full-time with it? Definitely. Um, so when are we going to launch? We are going to launch uh, publicly between uh, October 15th and October 31st, depending on when we get legal clearance. Um, and then when is the marker of going full-time on this? So individuals of our team, including co-founders, have already committed full-time, um, which is a great sign of confidence. And for myself, and we are actually talking about this as a team, is you know, when does this become some when does the transition happen wherein you're just a bunch of college kids messing around on a concept you find cool to this is actually going to impact someone's life and for me the mental switch happens when we see dollars through the door so when i can look at a student and they respond to my email and say you know my my uh, loans outstanding you just saved me thirty five thousand dollars across the lifetime of these loans you changed my life that's a moment for me as as emotional gratifying as that is, it's something that really gives our team and our mission and our purpose value and drive. And so it's something that we're really excited to. And for me is where the mental switch happens as to this is something that genuinely can help individuals and change the landscape. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's, you know, a great, a great place to, to judge it and judge its progress. And um, I want to ask you about your personal insights so far and your experience of founding this and and running it and i guess what has surprised you the most about yourself in the process of starting sparrow lending so what i would say is i, I didn't realize how much of a startup is about sales uh, i really mm -hmm. thought that if you build an amazing product they will come um, it's not necessarily the case especially when you're dealing with very sensitive financial information someone's bank account information their social security number um, and so Really my job right now, and this is sort of the attitude that I like to take for everybody on the team, is all of us are WIT, whatever it takes. Um, and so what that means on realistically is, you know, we have had across the summer hundreds of calls, not myself, but of, of the team, um, with prospective lenders, with prospective students, just trying to ensure that when we do launch, we'll have ready demand. Um, and so I've been surprised with how much my day-to-day -day is, is truly just selling. Okay, that's really interesting. And to follow up on that, do you feel like there were any stereotypes around being a founder and being your own boss that were, you know, totally debunked once you actually were thrown into it? Yeah, um, definitely. I, I think there's two things. The first is age. You know, my my personal hero is is Elon Musk, and he's been doing this since our age. Um, and so when you're have, we're in the room and you're on the conversation at the negotiation table with individuals 2x or sometimes 2.5x your own age, um, it can get a little patronizing at first. They can be like, here, here, let the adults take it from here. And um, taking some authority and, and ethos in those conversations is something that I've, I've had to glean inspiration from those who have done it, like Elon Musk. The second thing that I was going to say is, and this is often, I, I think, a misconfound uh, conception about founding is you have to be very technical. Um, my background itself is in engineering, but one of our co-founders and a lot of the members on our team don't come from engineering backgrounds, don't come from computer science backgrounds. It's truly about finding a problem that's worth going after, finding a solution that captures value in a way that no other one can, and then having the two align and bringing it to market. You don't need a technical background to do so. Well, that's really good advice. And I want to get one more piece of advice from you that you've received. Is there a piece of advice that you've received along the way that you keep very close? And you know, the more you go into it, the more, the more you realize the truth in it that you could share with the viewers today. Yes. That piece of advice is you don't start a company because you want to start a company. Starting a company is kind of, and this is to paraphrase from Elon Musk, is like chewing glass and looking to the abyss of death. You have to have ultimate persistence and it has to be something that genuinely pulls you out of bed in the morning and that you go to bed thinking about at night. If you're pushing yourself to do it, 
your persistence will wail and very quickly the efforts will be futile. And so having genuine passion for what you're doing, an authentic drive to try and see it through is night and day difference of you know what keeps me coming back to work every day versus just giving up on the 15th call when someone said no. Well, that's really great advice. Thank you. And thank you, Harrison, so much for speaking with us today. And I really look forward to the launch of Sparrow, as I'm sure that, you know, millions of college students will too. And thank you everyone for watching today. And I'll see you soon on Silicon Valley 2.0. Thank you. Thanks.